Hello to everybody who's logging on still. This is wonderful to see so many people have this interest. Um, I myself am really looking forward to this webinar. And I, I should say, am Sarah Kolber with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. I've been with CWF for almost 20 years now, working for the most part in the gardening for wildlife capacity, doing a variety of things. Um, so I'm very glad to see all of you here. And um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I wanted to say uh, that we are gonna have a follow-up email for those of you who are logging on now and didn't hear before, there will be a follow-up email with uh, the replay link and some hopefully helpful links. Any questions go in the Q&A, which I see I think are going in there already. So that's perfect. And at the end of the webinar, we'll ask them of Colleen. And in a minute, I'll get to Colleen's uh, bio, but first I wanted to do something um, which is a land acknowledgement, sort of Sarah, Sarah style. So I wish to acknowledge that I am on unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, and that I respect the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land, of which we're all a part. And considering the focus of the Guarding for Wildlife program, I also wanted to add a little bit, and that I think it's so perfect that the First Nations people are known for being wise stewards of the land and you know, taking only what they need, what they do take, using it all so fully, very wisely, and having so much respect and appreciation for the plant, for the animal, for, for the earth. And so I think, you know, all of us joining in together with this love of the land and the earth coming together and doing whatever we can to nurture it together. So on that note, we'll get to Colleen, who's gonna help us learn more about native shrubs and of which there are so many beautiful ones in Canada. And hello, in Helen, St. Pascal, um, Prince Edward County, Burnaby, Vancouver. Oh, this is awesome. I'm so glad to see you all here. I'm going to just minimize my chat now for a minute. I see more people are still logging on. That's great, welcome. We're gonna have questions in the Q&A and put your chat and say where you're from. Welcome to you all. So I'm very excited that Colleen is doing this webinar. She is a terrific, terrific source of information for this. She's an absolute gem to know. She spent many years in the world of nature interpretation, protection and restoration, including 12 years at the Toronto Region Conservation Authority and two and a half years at Ontario Nature. And from October, 2015 to July of 2020, Colleen was director of education at the Toronto Botanical Garden. And in this capacity, Colleen brought a conservation and sustainability perspective to programs and policies and practices. Uh, Colleen has served on many environmental committees and boards, including the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, LEAF, and Project Swallowtail. She's also a longtime volunteer with a local community meal program called Dinner with Dig Dignity. And long ago, Colleen completed undergraduate and master's degrees in environment and resource studies. It was an urban tree planting gig, though, that's following her first year of university that turned her on to native plants. This obsession continues today. All right. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass things over to Colleen. And just a reminder, questions go in the Q&A for after the webinar. And uh, chat, you're still welcome to say hello and where you're from, because I see we've still got people logging on. So that's lovely. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to mute myself and pass this over to Colleen. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Sarah, if you could just let me know, can you hear me all right? And is my screen showing? I hear you perfectly and I okay. see your screen beautifully, yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Well, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I always enjoy talking about native plants with other native plant lovers. So I'm looking forward to the next hour together with you guys. It is a bit strange not seeing your faces and only seeing my big head in the corner there, but I'll do my best. Thank you so much, Sarah, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, series of webinars. So let's start uh, with why we're doing this webinar. I am a, a lover of native shrubs. There are so many that I feel are underused and underrecognized. We don't see them often in our gardens, at least not here in the Toronto area where I live. However, they're essential and not just from an ecological point of view, but they really add a lot to our garden, the aesthetics of our gardens. And they're really fascinating. I'm going to start our presentation tonight with some definitions, uh, including what is a shrub exactly, what are invasive species versus native species versus 
non-native and naturalized. And then we're gonna go into some species profiles and then talking about planting and caring for your shrubs, creating community and habitat for species at all different stages of their lives. And we'll end with some, a list of resources and sources, which will also be emailed to you as Sarah mentioned. And we'll have time at the end for some questions. Featured here in the slide, this first slide is Fragrant Sumac, which I'm not really gonna talk about too much uh, tonight. I love it and look at that beautiful fall color, except it doesn't have a really large range. I, I went with most of the species, sorry, most of the species I went with have quite a large range because I knew that you were gonna be coming to this webinar from various places across the country. So let's get started. Let's start with defining a shrub, which I know sounds so, so simple, but we're gonna do it anyway, because we're gonna talk about function, not just what exactly it is. So it's a plant that has a woody stem and usually multiple stems or always multiple stems. It's shorter or smaller in stature than a tree. And it, like all other plants, it transfers energy from the sun uh, to higher trophic level layers, including insects, birds, and mammals like us. Various parts of shrubs are consumed by various wildlife, including bark, leaves, flowers, fruit, seeds, and roots. The form and the size of shrubs can vary quite a bit, which means that there is a shrub for every possible type of uh, garden situation you have going on. Um, form and size, as I said, can, can really vary. And right here we have a dogwood, uh, red osier dogwood, but I'm thinking of the difference between, say, a really tall choke cherry and a small little New Jersey tea, which is a, a shrub that comes into Ontario that's more a Carolinian species. It's quite tiny. And there are others like um, bush, bush honeysuckle here in, in Ontario that is also extremely small. And then we have the choke cherry that's really large. Some of our shrubs uh, are more delicate in their, their structure, like an ultraleaf dogwood that has the very horizontal branches. And others are really free flowing or have more of an arched um, form like uh, elderberry. This is a, a picture from a really beautiful native plant garden that's been around for 20 years. So this woman, this gardener was really ahead of her time. This is in Etobicoke. And I put this picture up so I can talk about native plants. That's a pretty picture of native plants in the fall. So a native plant is a plant that's existed here for millennia. And it has evolved along with other native plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi in the presence of native soils and native climatic conditions. This vegetation may also be referred to as indigenous, and it's definitely very connected to indigenous cultures. The plants were used for food, fiber, uh, ceremony, and medicine. Native plants play an important and foundational role in ecosystems. They provide food, shelter, and nesting material for all sorts of wildlife. Despite their beauty and their ecological importance, they are underused in our gardens. And so that's why I, I, I just think they're so fantastic for various reasons, for their beauty, but also their function. And that's why I'm always promoting their use in gardens. And, I, and I'm so glad that you're here today and you share that desire. We're not gonna talk about all plants today. We're just gonna talk about the group that are the multiple stem, multi-stemmed woody plants, the shrubs. I just wanna talk briefly about specialization, um, which is a, a term we use in ecology. So while it's true that non-native plants can provide shelter, nesting opportunities, and some food options for wildlife, native plants support a greater diversity and number of native wildlife species at all stages of their life. The significant difference is the ability of native plants to support native insects. It's a chemistry thing. Our plant eating insects have evolved with native plants so that they can combat the defenses of some of those plants and avoid those for which they cannot. Many insects, especially in the larva stage, are specialized feeding on one plant or a small number of plants. The extreme specialization example that's usually given is the monarch and the milkweed because the monarch larva, the caterpillar, can only consume milkweed plants. 
Non-native plants are brand new to these insects and not palatable. Our insects have not evolved with them and cannot combat their chemical defenses to consume them and derive nourishment. And this also plays into invasive species because insects in native ranges can keep plants in check, but sometimes non-native plants come here and they don't have insect, uh, they don't have herbivores eating them. And so they're able to become invasive. That, that adds to their invasiveness. When our gardens and parks are filled with non-native plants, we have fewer insects and fewer birds that rely on them for food, either throughout their lifespan or for part of it. We know that baby songbirds rely almost exclusively on insects. When you plant a non-native plant, it's a bit like serving your family plastic food. Let's talk briefly about some other categories of plants. So non-native plants, those are plants that are introduced from another area of uh, another part of the world by human activity, whether accidentally or intentionally, but they don't cause serious damage to our ecology or our economy or to human health. Uh, naturalized, these are non-native species that have dispersed themselves, but they still do not, they're not considered a serious threat to native species. And then we have the invasive plants. So invasive plants are non-native. They've come from somewhere else. They readily disperse in the region and they neg ne negatively impact native biodiversity, the economy and or human health. In most provinces, there is a list of invasive species and there's also a list of watch species. So species that are non-native that are showing some tendencies of invasiveness. And I'm gonna give you some resources at the end if you're interested in learning more about that. And unfortunately, horticulture is a pathway for invasive plants. But I'm a big gardener and I always think it doesn't have to be that way. I'm a gardener and a naturalist and I, those two not only can come together, they have to come together in 2021 when we're facing um, climate change and biodiversity loss. They have to come together to be part of the solution. These are shrubs that I grew up with and they're probably shrubs that you're familiar with as well. We have lilac, forsythia, uh, honeysuckle, and burning bush or euonymus. None of these are native, so they're all non-native. A couple of them are considered invasive, burning bush and honeysuckle for sure. And many of the other plants that I, I, that I grew up with were non-native, possibly invasive as well. It wasn't until I was in my late teens and I started studying uh, ecology, physical geography at university and did that urban tree planting gig that I really made the distinction between native and non-native plants and, and absolutely fell in love with native plants. Why are, am I talking about native plant shrubs and adding them, native shrubs and adding them to your garden? Well, I discussed why they're so important from an ecological point of view. Um, and Talame talks about adding these native plants to our garden because so much of our world is already settled. And that's certainly so in Southern Ontario where I live and probably where many of you live as well because many of us live in towns and cities. So we can't just rely on our provincial parks, our conservation areas to protect natives, native um, plants and native wildlife. In fact, many of those places are becoming more and more overrun with invasive plants. So our gardens are this great um, untapped or undertapped opportunity to restore native plant communities and the wildlife that comes with them. And why shrubs? Well, as I mentioned before, they're beautiful. They have a diversity of structures and colors of, and the colors uh, can be with their leaves, with their blooms, with their flowers, with their fruit. Uh, you can use them for particular functions like privacy, and as a, to provide shade if they're tall enough. Some uh, shrubs are really interesting too in that they have a lovely scent. Here in Southern Ontario, we have fragrant sumac and we have spice bush. Sound, not themselves, but they bring with them when you plant native shrubs, you will definitely get birds. It's definitely a case of if you plant them, they will come. I've seen that in my own backyard. I have some vireos and warblers traveling through my yard right now because it's migration. So you get the beautiful sounds of songbirds when you plant native shrubs. 
and food for us. Uh, I'm a lover of food as probably many of you are. And so when you plant things like service berry, nanny berry, you get to use the fruit. You can leave some for wildlife and you can enjoy some uh, yourself. You can also use some of the products for the parts of these shrubs for personal care products and even for um, herbal medicines. So beyond what they do for us, they're essential members of, members of our native ecosystems. They're found in forests, wetlands, savannas and prairies. And yeah, you just definitely, the different layers is, is really important in your garden. Many of the birds that um, we love so much spend part of their lives, at least in the, in the shrub layer or lower canopy. That's where they're gonna find insects for their chicks early in the spring and then fruit later in the summer. Some of the, um, for some of the species that I'm gonna profile, I'll mention right now, some of the birds that they attract or the insects that they attract. Willows, let's start with willows because they support a tremendous number of insects. They are host plants for caterpillars of red spotted purple and viceroy, as well as morning cloak butterflies. And the moths that they support include the io moth, which is, uh, so these are the caterpillars, sorry, not the actual adult, uh, the io moth caterpillar and the luna moth caterpillar. And you can't have those beautiful moths like a luna moth without having the caterpillar first. The dogwood uh, species, dogwoods will support um, the caterpillars of the azure butterfly. The azure butterfly will consume the seed pods and the flowers. Choke cherry is a host to coral hair streak caterpillar. And I'm gonna mention a few different types of viburnum which are really important for wildlife. And they support, uh, just as an example, because they support so many, we can't mention them all, the larva of spring azure and hummingbird clearwing moth. I'm gonna move down here to the next slide. So one of my favorite books ever is Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Talame. I bet a number of you are familiar with it. One uh, handy little guide that he has in there is a list of species or sorry, genuses that, or genera, you can use either term for the plural of genus. Uh, so the different groups of woody species that support the greatest number of Lepidoptera. Uh, so not all insects, when you do science, you can't look at everything all at once. So he looked at woody plants and he looked at a group of insects called Lepidoptera. And, and most specifically, he looked at the uh, larva stage. So the caterpillars, not the adult moth or, or butterfly, but the caterpillars. And through all the research he did and the research done by his masters and PhD students, he determined, they determined that oak or Quercus is the genus, uh, which, um, you know, we have ecozones that come into Canada too. So it's definitely relevant to us. And willow is second in terms of most supportive of caterpillars. Cherry plum come next and on and on. He has a long list. I just put the top five here on this on the screen, but page 147 of that book has a long list. So if, for me, this is really handy because I'm a very pragmatic person and I have a small garden. So I, I try to make sure I'm hitting uh, all of the, the, the biodiversity um, leaders. So these ones here. And then in terms of herbaceous, I wanna make sure that I have the, the big, um, the golden rods and the asters and other ones that support the greatest number of species of insects. So let's talk about uh, choke cherry. Uh, in some cases, I'm going to have an actual in, a specific species that I'm going to speak about, and I'm going to have that listed at the very top on that little uh, orange bar. And other times I'm going to have a genus up there because there are a number of species within that genus that you might want to consider depending on where you live in Canada. So let's start with chokecherry, which is part of the prunus uh, genus. So when you're looking at the name of a species, and I apologize if this is old news for everyone, but you have a common name. Sometimes you have multiple common names, which makes it confusing. So it's really handy when you go to, to look for plants to know the Latin name as well. And the Latin name is two words, the first one being the genus, and then the second one will make it the species name. So you have Prunus virginiana is the species name for chokecherry. Uh, so this is this group is high up on Talamay's list. It's third uh, out of many. 
And um, the reason it's, it supports so many uh, caterpillars, including inchworms, many species of inchworms. And who loves to eat inchworms? Birds do. So you definitely, if you want birds in your backyard, putting in a prunus tree is handy or shrub. So if you have the space for a tree, you might want to even consider the wild cherry, which is in the prunus family. But here is choke cherry I'm featuring right now. Look at those beautiful flowers and those beautiful uh, berries that come in July. They are copious berry producers, choke cherry, which helps sustain birds in the summer. And what we're going to here over and over again tonight is that many of these shrubs are going to be helpful in the spring for birds because they're hosting the insects that the birds need, uh, the baby birds need in the spring, and then they're going to offer fruit in the summer and into early fall when the birds need fruit uh, to get ready for the winter when its uh, resources are low or to help with migration. And our native shrubs and this is something that Talame talks about in his other book, Nature's Best Hope. Our native shrubs late in the summer are offering berries that are high fat, and that is really good for migration support and to help birds prepare for winter, the ones that are resident, because some are gonna migrate and some are gonna stay put, but they all need the high fat berries. Um, sometimes people think of choke cherry as a weed. I know my father-in-law and I used to fight about this. Uh, because it does grow very easily in all different environments and you often don't have to plant it, it just shows up. But I happen to think that's a wonderful thing, especially for a, a plant that is so supportive of um, biodiversity. Cherry, uh, choke cherry can grow from four to 10 meters to pop tall, depending on the environment. The white flowers in the spring are followed by purple red berries in the summer, which you see here, which are consumed by all types of birds, including cardinals, blue jays, orioles, tanagers, and woodpeckers. We can process them. We can eat the berries as well and process them into jams, jellies, syrup, and wine. Chokecherry prefers full sun to partial shade, and it does fine in disturbed poor soil. Now, sometimes if you have a chokecherry, you might get black knot, which is a type of, um, a type of fungus, I think, it's a disease. And so if that shows up on your stems or on your branches, you likely want to remove that, but do the removal in the winter time when the shrub is mostly dormant. This is one of my all time favorites. It's a smaller shrub overall than the choke cherry. It has a similar, similar common name, but it's choke cherry, not choke berry. Sorry, this one is choke berry and the prune, the uh, genus is Aronia. So I'm featuring right here pictures of black choke cherry, the flowers and the berry. It's a smaller tree and more rounded, not, not like tall and thin. Um, the berries are edible, although not, I don't particularly enjoy them raw, but you could definitely put them into a smoothie or bake with them. All right, just getting myself a little bit mixed up here. So um, I think I actually missed the willows, but we'll do choke cherry right now and then I'll go back to the willows, choke berry. So um, this one is also going to be really attractive for birds in the spring for the insects and then for uh, the berries later on. In the Grow Me Instead Guide for Ontario, which is an amazing little resource that tells you what invasive plant you, you want to avoid and, and what you can use in its place. We promote chokeberry as an alternative to burning bush, which is that plant I showed you earlier on that has the bright red leaves. Many people plant burning bush for the fall color, but it's an invasive plant and the seeds are spread by birds. Here in Ontario or in Southern Ontario, we see it in a lot of natural areas that are in the ravines in Toronto. So if we have gardens close to our natural areas, that's one of the garden invasives that goes into those natural areas. An alternative would be choke berry, which is from the Aronia family. This is an excellent choice if you want edible fruit, you want birds and you want fall colors, so you get it all. It's a great option for rain gardens and stream banks. Um, it prefers full to part sun, medium moisture, sand, loam, or clay. And it's a good option in the city because it is also salt tolerant. 
So that's a great option for you. It doesn't get very tall, maybe up to five feet tall, but it's more bushy than some of our shrubs. Now let's talk about the willows, which are really uh, very supportive of insects. I think they're the second one, yep, yeah, second on Talame's ranking for supporting Lepidoptera larva. There are many species available to us here in Canada. Uh, they exist in diverse habitats. And the, the large massive trunked ones that we typically see in our cities are not the native ones. They are European species. So our native ones are more shrubs than really, really tall, big trees. Here I'm picturing or I'm featuring pussy willow, which is just one option for you, but I went with pussy willow because it has a large range. So it would work in many parts of Canada, across Canada. The, um, it's a multi-stem shrub. It has a rounded form. It grows up to 19 feet, so it, it's quite big. The male catkins, which are featured here, are white at first and then uh, yellow as the pollen is released. The female catkins appear on separate plants and have green capsules. Willows provide pollen and nectar for early emerging insects, which is really important. I know when I was young, I didn't see a lot of willows in the subdivision where I lived. And so I thought that the fact that there was some clover in the lawn was enough for the bees. But uh, through the learning I've done over the years, I've, I've realized that there's, or discovered, learned, there's a difference in the quality of pollen and that it's often the native plants, such as willow, that the, the insects really need for high quality pollen early in the season. The pussy willow is also the larva host plant for morning cloak butterfly, viceroy butterfly, hair streaks, dusky wings. So all of those types of butterflies, the caterpillars will feed on willow. And morning cloak is an interesting uh, butterfly because it overwinters here in, in Ontario. I actually don't know the full range of, of morning cloak butterfly, but it's a lovely butterfly that overwinters as an adult. So when it emerges in the spring, and it, there might still be snow on the ground, it's got to look really quickly for uh, a, a source of nectar. The pussy willow prefers full sun to part shade, medium to wet soil, sand or loam. It's great for shorelines, low areas, as well as naturalized and pollinator gardens. Other willows to consider, if you're out in the West, you might wanna try Scowler's Willow, which is common out on the West Coast. It's fast growing, it tolerates short, period, short periods of droughts, and it can get quite tall. A couple other options for you, Sage Leaved Willow, which is gorgeous, multi-stemmed, and has a really wide range as well. It goes all the way from Labrador to, to BC. And another one I'll mention, because I just think it's, it's beautiful, is peach leaved willow, which would be great in a garden, and it's native from Ontario to British Columbia. Likely my all-time favorite is a shrub, native shrub is serviceberry, and I have a little habit of purchasing it for every, every baby that I, that I know of in my life. All my nieces and nephews get one, because it's a wonderful thing to grow up with a service berry. Uh, in a few years, it will start producing these berries that you can pick uh, with your family. Before that, you will get these beautiful white blooms. They're prolific. And then in the fall, you get the lovely color. Uh, the other thing that I love about the service berries in my yard and all my friends' and family's yards is all the birds that are, that are attracted to service berry. So definitely a, a fantastic shrub for the garden. It gives and gives and gives. Service berries grow between 15 and 25 feet, depending on conditions. The canopy is open and the bark is a lovely light gray. So it's a really pretty structure for those that are interested in aesthetics. There's an explosion of white flowers, as I said, in early spring, and they are followed by a bounty of dark purple berries in early summer. The early blossoms entice bees and butterflies which pollinate the flowers. This shrub is the larva host for uh, various caterpillars, including the white prominent moth and the white admiral butterfly, which is a pretty common butterfly here in Ontario. The berries are nutritious and delicious, apparently more nutritious than blueberries, and we all know how nutritious those are. Here in Ontario, we enjoy the berries late June, early July, although it can change depending on moisture and temperature, but that's typically when they show up. 
in my backyard, I get a lot of uh, woodpeckers and robins coming to the service berries, but uh, it also attracts orioles, thrushes, and waxwings. I just don't have those in my neighborhood, unfortunately. Service berry prefers full sun with berry production reduced in the shade. It tolerates clay and pollution. So this is one of the, our native plants, which actually is quite common in nurseries. Most of our native plants, you have to go to specialized nurseries, which is, is difficult. Many people aren't gonna make that extra effort, but this one, along with a couple of our dogwoods, you can pretty easily find. I would still suggest bringing the full Latin name if you're looking for a particular type of service berry. There are different species and different common names of the species used across Canada. So it's a little bit confusing. There's Western service berry or Saskatoon berry called Amelanchier alnifolia. So you might wanna check that out if you're on the West Coast or in the prairies. Service berry and, and all sorts of other berry producing shrubs have a huge connection to indigenous cultures. And I was just on a website last week that I thought was wonderful. So I wanted to mention it. If you're out on the West Coast and you're interested in berry producing shrubs and and how they've been used historically by the indigenous cultures in the West, on the West Coast. There's a website called Biodiversity of the Central Coast. It's uh, just a .org website, and that has a lot of information and photos. Various people can contribute, academics and people living in those areas can contribute uh, stories and photos. And that shrub there that you see the top right uh, corner um, those are the, that's the kind of uh, bounty that I get every year from my service berry. So you get a lot of fruit from one shrub even. Now let's talk about a group of plants, uh, a group of shrubs in the Sambucas family or the elderberry genus, I should say. So the one that I have featured here, the pictures are of common or Canada elderberry. It has two different common names. And then you see the Latin name underneath. There are two native elderberry shrubs that you can consider for your garden. The other, this is one, and the other one is the red uh, elderberry, which is Sembucus racemosa. And I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly. These are similar in form with overlapping ranges. So check out the ranges. And, and if you have a little bit of a bigger garden, I can't have this in my garden because it's a little too, it spreads a little too much and it has that arching form, but I absolutely love it. I get to enjoy this shrub when I go to my inland's garden, inland in-laws um, cottage in Gravenhurst. You see this along the stream banks and along the pond edges and also in the ditches uh, by roads. And it's just gorgeous. I do really love the form, the arching branches, and then these huge displays of creamy white flowers in the spring. Uh, it's a fast growing multi-stem stem shrub with a broad rounded crown. And the lightly scented showy white flowers show, in, show up at least here in June and July, followed by drooping clusters of purple black berries in August and September. The flowers and the fruit can be used in various ways for edible products, including jellies, pies, juice, and wine. The flower nectar is consumed by small sweat bees, small carpenter bees, mining bees, and this shrub is also the larva host plant for the gray hair streak and morning cloak butterfly. So you can see all these shrubs have these incredible connections with other species, as well as being beneficial to us. Height for this particular shrub varies from five to 12 feet. The spread varies from five to 12 feet. It prefers sun to part shade and moist to wet sandy loam soil. You can use it as a landscape specimen uh, if you have the space. It's a good shrub border if you want to put a mass of planting together side by side. You can use them for screens, backgrounds, around your ponds if you have a pond or along a stream. It's a good sprawling hedge if you have the space. Now this one along with a few others that I'm mentioning does tend to sucker so that just means that they'll produce new stems around the main stem. And that's easy to deal with in the spring. You just go out with your pruning shears and cut the suckers down right at the base. Dogwood. Uh, thankfully, we do see some of our native dogwoods in the nurseries. And there are so many to choose from. 
I put this one up because it's my personal favorite and because it has a, a large range in Canada. So it goes across much of Canada. So this is the alternate leaf dogwood, Cornus altenifolia. So many of these shrubs have white flowers. I think I only have one that doesn't have a white flower. So there's a lot of white in the native uh, shrub layer, that's for sure. So many native species, you want to find out which ones are native to your area. Alternate leaf dogwood is unique among the dogwoods. As the name would suggest, it has an alternate leaf pattern as opposed to opposite leaves along the stem. Uh, it's also called pagoda dogwood for its attractive horizontal tiers. So um, I'll just try and use my hands to, to show you how it works, but the, the layers of branches are, are quite horizontal and that just is a, a, gives a pretty effect in the garden. Um, it's a common understory or forest edge species throughout southern Ontario. There are large clusters of white flowers in the spring, followed by dark blue berries on red stalks in midsummer. So look how pretty those berries are in the stalks. These are berries that we don't consume, but many wildlife species do. They, uh, the ultralith dogwood can reach up to 10 meters in ideal conditions. It prefers partial shade and evenly most soils that are well-drained. If it's in full sun, you want to provide ample watering and mulch. Birds such as vireos, bluebirds, catbirds, kingbirds, junk, juncos, the list goes on, waxwings, grosbeaks will all consume these high fat berries. As I said, we do not eat these berries. Uh, many insects feed on the leaves, wood, and other parts of, the dog, of dogwood shrubs, including moth and butterfly caterpillars, which are food for hungry songbirds. Another beautiful dogwood that you might want to consider, especially if you want some color in the winter time in your garden, is the Red Osier Dogwood, which has a large range as well. And in BC, you could consider the Pacific Dogwood, which is Cornus nutali. Again, I might be saying that species incorrectly, the name, but the Pacific Dogwood would be a good option for BC. It has a small range, so I didn't feature it in the, the slide. Viburnum. So there's another genus here that we're going to look at. I've got one species featured in the pictures, but I'll mention a few others. So this is nanny berry, one of the first native uh, species that I got to become familiar with. And I, it's another one that gives and gives all season, all through the seasons. So this is a truly beautiful plant. It's, it's um, not that well used in gardens. It has, it grows in a great diversity of habitats, or sorry, viburnums do, from swamps to old growth forests to dry open spaces. And I'm sure that you'll be able to find a viburnum that will work in your garden. Nanny berry is a multi stem shrub that produces flowers that are showy white in the spring and then uh, showy purple flower fruit in the summer. The berries attract many birds, including robins thrashers, catbirds, cardinals, and waxwings. The good thing about these berries is we can eat them. So this is another one that's uh, edible for us as well as wildlife. Nanny berry reaches 10 to 15 feet in height. It prefers full to part sun, medium to wet soil, and well-drained soil. It tolerates drier sites as well, especially once it's established. You can use it as a specimen shrub. And you can use it in a wildlife garden. You can create a hedge with them. In the Ontario Grow Me Instead guide, we uh, use it as a, or suggest it as an alternative to Barbary, which is a non-native plant, which is invasive in some parts of Canada. Other viburnum species that you might want to consider if you're in my area, Ontario, is uh, our arrowwood, viburnum dentatum, and hobblebush, which is just so gorgeous and that is Alverni, uh, Viburnum alnifolium. Another one I wanted to mention was wild raisin. So those are three that would also work in Ontario, Quebec area. Now, Sarah loves this one. So I, I decided to include it. And actually, who doesn't love high bush cranberry? It's, it's lovely. Um, same, same thing, like just produces, produces, produces for us and for wildlife all, all through the year. So this is a truly beautiful plant. It's been ignored or even displaced by its European counterpart, the uh, European highbush cranberry or European cranberry. 
Uh, but you can determine, it's hard to tell them apart when you just look at them, but if the fruit is out and you taste them, you can tell the difference right away because the high bush cranberry is less, uh, less tart, less acidic. I still don't like to eat them raw, but the other one, the European one, it's a terrible taste. And the other thing you look at is where the leaf meets the leaf stem and there's a little gland there and the difference between the two is supposed to be obvious. However, I still can have a hard time determining if it's a European or the native American high bush cranberry. To complicate matters, the two have hybridized in certain areas. That's certainly the case in Southern Ontario where many of the European ones are sold as uh, ornamental plants. Uh, high bush cranberry is a medium height multi-stem shrub that grows eight to 13 feet tall and spreads up to nine feet. It has maple-like leaves with three lobes. You can see those deep lobes, those cuts in the leaves, and coarse teeth. The leaves turn a glorious purple red in the fall. You can see the bottom photo there. Young plants have red or green colored twigs, while older plants will have a, a dark, like a gray or a brown bark to them. The showy white flowers appear, appear in late spring or early summer. And those bright red berries, uh, they turn red at maturity. So they're not red to start, but they turn red when they're ready to eat. And that happens in late summer, or early fall. While the berries are not a favorite of many birds, they are a very important survival food. As I mentioned earlier, talking about survival berries um, for resident birds, as well as migratory birds. So the resident birds are gonna need it, uh, that food as the winter progresses. And those will often, those berries will often remain on the shrub into the winter time. This is true for ruffed grouse, cedar waxwings, thrushes, cardinals, and grosbeaks. And then migratory birds will consume the berries as they're preparing for the long trek south. Uh, Viburnum highbush cranberry is the American one, is found naturally across much of southern Canada. It occurs naturally along stream banks, at the edges of marshes, and in forested wetlands. It's a good choice for ditches, for rain gardens, shorelines, or other wet areas. It prefers full sun to light shade and moist, well-drained soil with a lot of decaying organic matter. This is one you don't want to put in a, a new subdivision right smack in the middle of your lawn. I would suggest uh, leaving it for um, a different type of environment that has a little more organic matter in the soil and wet soil. If you are gonna put it in a fairly dry area, you will need to water it and perhaps also keep a, a fairly thick mulch layer around the, on the soil. Now we're gonna move away from the viburnums and move on to the one that I'm featuring that doesn't have white flowers, that has a different color flower. So I have here photos of the smooth rose or Rosa blanda. And this is one of two roses I'll mention that would work in many of our gardens across Canada. Uh, this is an alternative to the fussy cultivated roses and to the white flowers of most of the native shrubs, as I mentioned. Smooth rose is multi-stemmed, it's bushy, it grows about to four feet. In the late spring and summer, it produces these beautiful pale pink flowers with five saucer-like petals surrounding a yellow center. In the late summer and fall, it produces bright red rose hips, which persist through the winter. And this is the stage that mine is at right now. The leaves are still green. They haven't turned much, uh, but the rose hips are out, which are a nice, uh, will add a little bit of color to the garden. Um, long tongued bees, such as bumblebees, digger bees, and green metallic bees, plus surfeit flies and some beetles will visit the flowers for pollen. Many moth caterpillars feed on the leaves, while other insects feed on the pithy stem, the buds, the flowers, and the rose hips. You'll often read about cutting some of the stems to increase circulation in the rose shrub, in the rose bush, and you can do that, but those pithy stems are really important for insect habitat. So if you have the space, cut the stem, but then leave the stem somewhere in your garden. And we'll talk a little more about that in a later slide. All right, so this one will also produce suckers. It spreads by rhizomes, but the suckers can be easily removed. 
and you can easily pass those along to others because the suckers you can you can propagate this one through suckers you don't need to start from seed all right moving on to Coriolis so I've got featured right here the beaked hazel Coriolis cornata and this is a lovely one that I see often when I go up to my in-laws cottage at the top left that's what you see in the spring so I think it's it's really beautiful against the very gray landscape to see a little bit of yellow and a little bit of red. Beaked hazel is a medium-sized shrub. It's found across much of North America. It's a great hedge alternative to privet or burning bush. So those are two native, non-native and invasive species. So if you want an alternative for a hedge, you might want to consider beaked hazel. It grows four to eight feet tall and wide, and it's, it's very tolerant of pruning, which makes it also a, a good option for a hedge. Before leaf out in the early spring, you have these drooping yellow, gray male catkins, which you see here in the photo. And they begin developing the previous fall. They grow and become very obvious, like you see here in the spring, on the, and the twigs are still bare, so you get to see them really clearly. They pollinate the red female flowers, which develop in the spring. And there you can see the red flower in that photo. The fall color here is yellow, so not super bright, but still a nice addition to the fall landscape. The nuts will ripen in August and September, and they can be roasted for us to eat. However, you can also just leave them for wildlife, which love the nuts. They're also a high fat option for wildlife species. They are not the commercially avail available filbert you might be familiar with. So this is not a commercially produced nut but still something that we can eat. The husk surrounding the nut extends beyond the nut by at least one inch, and, and that's how it gets its common name. It kind of looks like a beak. And that's also a good way to identify this particular species. This uh, species prefers full sun to partial shade, medium to wet soil, but it's highly adaptable. It naturally occurs from Quebec west to British Columbia. Another hazelnut that I want to mention in the same genus is American hazel. So Coriolis americana. It can tolerate drier sites than this beaked hazel. It also makes a good hedge. It also has edible nuts for us. Uh, it tolerates clay and black walnut, which is good if you have a big black walnut in your backyard. Uh, although sometimes I think that is overstated the difficulty. Uh, to grow under black walnut because black walnut naturally exists in communities and there are all sorts of plants that naturally grow around black walnut. But if you are having trouble and you're looking for some shrubs for your garden, you might want to consider American hazel. The native range of that is Eastern North America. And before I finish my profiles, I'll mention these two evergreen species because evergreens are super valuable as uh, specimens in our garden, and valuable to us, nice to look at, and important for wildlife. So the top left is the Canada yew, Taxus canadensis. Um, you're probably more familiar with the English and the Japanese versions of these. They're popular ornamentals, but we have our own yew, so why not use that one? It's a native species uh, that is, is, it's just an excellent addition to your garden. They're unusual conifer, conifers in that the seeds are not in cones, uh, but occur singly and are enclosed in a red fleshy berry-like structure, which I hope you can see. It's very small in that picture. You can Google the picture if you'd like. So Canada U, instead of having cones, they have these little berry-like structures and inside you will find the seeds. The Canada U is a low maintenance spreading shrub. You can also use it as alternative ground cover if you don't mind the height, because it can get up to four feet tall. Its native range is from Manitoba to the Atlantic provinces. It prefers partial shade and moist well-drained soil. It's great for mass plantings and also, as I mentioned earlier, the, the ground cover. I, obviously it's not a ground cover you can walk on, but it's, um, if you're looking for something low maintenance to take up space and provide wildlife habitat, throw in a U or this one that I'm gonna talk about now, the creeping juniper. So, oh, I just want to mention one more thing about the U. If you're out in the West Coast, there's the Western or Pacific U and that's a forest understory shrub. Uh, and it's 
typically found in moist areas in southern and western BC. So that might be an option for your garden. Now let's move on to the juniper. So the juniper that's featured here is creeping juniper, but there are four juniper species that are native to Canada. Two of them are trees, two are shrubs. This one, the shrub species jun Juniperus horizontalis, is a slow growing, long lived uh, shrub. It's uh, wonderful as a specimen planting, an alternative ground cover, provides excellent wildlife habitat and protection all year long for wildlife. It's perfect for rocky soils and hot, dry gardens. The female seed cones are very distinctive, looking more like a berry and often referred to as that. So those little juniper berries you see are act technically not a berry, but they're often called a berry and that's where you have the, the seed. So those are two options if you're looking for evergreen shrubs. So wanted to, just looking at the time, oh, I better wrap up quickly, uh, a little bit about planting and caring. And most of this stuff is all very um, intuitive probably. But I mentioned earlier about the Latin names and mentioned that common names can vary. So always a good idea to bring the common name and the Latin name when you're looking for uh, a native species because they aren't that available. And because many, not all, and, and it's better now, but you will find people that work in nurseries that aren't as familiar with native species as they are with the more commonly used ornamental. So to bring in the Latin name will help to make sure you get what you really want. And there are various uh, native plant societies across Canada. There's one in Alberta, one in BC. Here in Ontario, we have one called the North American Native Plant Society, which is a very lofty name, but it's most active in, in the greater Toronto area. So find those native plant um, societies, so they're not-for-profit organizations, often run by dedicated volunteers, and, and, and check their sites. They probably have native plant nurseries listed on their website. The North Ameri American Native Plant Society does, and I'll, the website is coming up. To improve the chances of success, you want to buy your specimens small and young. You want to plant them in the spring and the fall, ideally. If you plant, have to plant in the summer, that's okay. It's just that uh, the plant is spending a lot of time producing above ground growth and you want to make sure that you water and mulch. Putting a mulch mat down in or a mulch donut is a good idea in the first the first year to reduce competition and to maintain moisture. And I say donut instead of a cone. And this is probably all if you're gardeners, you know this, but sometimes I see uh, commercially planted uh, or planted by large companies, the, the mulch will be like a a pile of mulch up against the bark and that's not ideal. You wanna have the bark clear and a donut shape of mulch around the stem, the main stem. Um, planting a community is always a good idea, not just a species, not just one species. I have right here a picture of a very small native plant garden that our friends put in, in a, a new subdivision in Brampton. And two years after putting in all those shrubs, that little sawwood owl appeared. So absolutely amazing. Um, nobody in the neighborhood appreciated those native plants until the sawwood owl showed up. And then everyone was like, I want one of those. And so then they were able to encourage a few of their neighbors, not too many, but a few of them to put in some native shrubs and trees. Uh, leave the mess. My, mo my motto is that messy is habitat. I, I, it, I don't think of it as mess. I think of it as habitat, the building blocks of homes for birds that use all these things and homes for our insects. So leaving the leaves is a great idea. It's also a, a way to reduce your cost on bringing in mulch. You can just use all the debris that shows up in your garden naturally. If you do want to prune your garden for aesthetics, sorry, prune your shrubs for aesthetics or for health reasons, maybe there's a bit of disease somewhere or for safety reasons, maybe there's a branch that's high up that's falling. You obviously just want to follow a few uh, basic things like using clean and sharp instruments and then if you have spring flowering shrubs, you usually want to prune right after the flowering. However, if you have summer flowering shrubs, you want to wait and prune the following year at the end of winter or at the start of spring. Uh, if you have yews or junipers, like I featured in slides earlier, you can prune those late winter or early spring. If you're going to do just a light bit of pruning, you can do that in the summertime. If you have these native shrubs that are suckering, which many of ours do, 
don't stress about it. Just go in there and cut the suckers off at the base, right by the soil level, if you don't want a, a thicket or a colony showing up. Right now, although it's tempting to be out there in your garden doing some pruning, it's not a good time to prune because new growth will be susceptible to winter damage. So try to refrain from pruning uh, in the fall. I love this uh, demonstration garden that I, I saw this picture on Facebook, so I just put it in there. It demonstrates the concept of soft landings, which are very important. These, this is a concept that's been championed by a couple of ecologists that I followed, Douglas Talame and Heather Holm, who's a Canadian born ecologist, but she lives in the States in Minnesota. So soft landings are the diverse native plantings under, under trees and shrubs. These plantings provide critical shelter and habitat for one or more life cycle stages of moths, butterflies, and other insects, including bumblebees, fireflies, and beetles. So the idea is that sometimes some of our insects are insects are they metamorphosize, so they have different uh, life stages, and they exist in those life stages in different places in our garden. So it's not enough just to care for them when they're adults. You have to think about how they overwinter. You have to think about where they are when they're larvae, eggs on and on. So it's a bit complicated, but just follow what nature does. Go into your favorite natural area and see the different layers and all that habitat on the, the forest floor uh, and copy that as much as you can. So uh, Heather Holm is a fantastic person to follow along with Douglas Talame. And I, I think I do, um, I, will, I will definitely include that, her links in the email. Here are some of my favorite resources, including pictures of two Gromian stead guides. So Gromian stead guides address the issue of horticulture, the horticultural pathway for invasive plants. The one um, with the, the one on the left is the guide for Southern Ontario, and the one on the right is the guide for British Columbia. But there are a few other provinces that also have Gromian stead guides. Check them out because they offer great suggestions for native plants in place of the very well-known ornamental plants that uh, like burning bush that we now realize are invasive and really don't belong in our, our gardens anymore because they don't stay in our gardens, they move into local natural areas. So there are some options for uh, sources of information. Where you see the asterisk, those are also sources of plants because those um, organizations will share, uh, sorry, will have plant sales. But those are great for Ontario. If you want to find out about native plant sales and native plant nurseries, visit the Native Plant Society for your uh, province or your territory. These are some actual books, so not online resources, but books that I, I carry around like my Bibles. Uh, two are from Douglas Talame. And if you're interested in starting woody plants from seed, I would recommend the um, Growing Trees from Seed one that's listed there. These will all be included in the email, so no need to copy them down. Before I say goodbye, I wanted to mention this fabulous tool that I use all the time. It's a Canadian Wildlife Federation supported tool. And I find it very helpful when I go into new natural areas or I'm exposed to a new native plant. I use the iNaturalist app on my phone and I'm not a very tech savvy person, but it's extremely easy to download and use. So it helps me to identify a species. And if I like, I can add that identification that, that I can report it. And iNaturalist is a global community of naturalists. It's really fascinating. Uh, and you feel like you're contributing to science. I also uh, wanna mention an app that I use a lot for invasive species. You can report your invasive species to iNaturalist and or to EDD Maps. And there is an EDD Maps Ontario app, but there is also one for your other provinces and territories. And in fact, this is going to be a North American wide database soon, an app that's available for different states, provinces and territories. And we can all report on uh, existing and new invasions. So these are some important ways to identify and report native and invasive species. I wanted to share those with you in case you're not familiar with them. I may have gone on a little long. I apologize for that. Thank you so much for your patience. And I look forward to answering any of your questions or hearing any of your suggestions, hearing about your favorite shrubs that are native to Canada. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. Oh, hang on.
Uh, there we go. There's a bit of a delay. With me. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. That was fantastic. We're getting lots of lots of great comments and appreciation in the chat. So I think we all got a lot out of that. And let's go to some questions here because there's actually a lot of questions. I'm not sure we're going to get to too many, but we'll see what we can do. And again, just a reminder, we are going to have a follow up email. So we'll do our best to get some links in there for you as well that Colleen had mentioned. Um, Let's see, uh, I can't really do personalized ones right now because there are so many questions in general. Uh, one's asking, where can fragrant sumac grow? And we do have a native plant encyclopedia uh, that we'll send a link to where you can check and see the ranges. There's also another one called Can Plant, which is a beautiful new one done uh, that you might wanna check out. We'll include a link for that too. You show what looks like butterfly bush under the title non-native, etc. Do you consider that invasive? And I think that is considered invasive, isn't it now? Yeah. In um, Columbia, they consider it invasive. In Ontario, there are many naturalist ecologists that, that are watching it closely. So mm -hmm. uh, it seems to uh, endure the winter in British Columbia more, like it, sur it survives it. It, it. it doesn't knock it back as much as it does in Ontario. It, it does survive the winter in Ontario, but it still seems to be um, staying put for the most part. But the problem with butterfly bush uh, is just, as, as you know, Sarah, is that it does provide nectar, but it doesn't provide uh, the larva. It's not a larva host plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Mark, someone's asking, uh, I know you touched upon it, the difference in a plant that is naturalized and one that's native. I think, again, naturalized is non-native, but it has to be established itself. It's spread. Yes. It's considered a threat to our ecosystems, right? Well, naturalized has spread, but right now, so naturalized could be like a dandelion. So it's kind of a more considered maybe a weed, but not yet an invasive species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, let's see, I have a cedar hedge that provides shelter for a number of birds, but is not very productive. Otherwise, it does provide privacy for me. Is it worth replacing some of it? I imagine that it makes seeds so that different birds will come and feed off. Mm -hmm. So it's got food as well. Mm -hmm. I love the cedars I have in my yard, they're too big for my little yard, but that's where I get so much bird activity, especially in the winter time. So, I mean, obviously up to you, but it, I would think it, it has great wildlife value and it sounds like you appreciate the privacy too. So maybe just uh, incorporate some of those, if you can, if you have the space, the berry producing shrubs so that you can enjoy some of that fruit as well. So adding as opposed to replacing. And just some people are saying goodbye and thank you. And just to wish you all a great evening and thank you all for joining us, those who have to go. We'll answer a few more questions, but uh, thanks to all of you who have participated. Um, how far back do we go to determine native and non-native, i.e. pre-European contact? That's a very good question. A lot of people have asked that yeah. question yeah, over time. A lot, of people, a lot of people ask that even in the ecology world, there will be debates among ecologists. And I don't actually get hung up on that. I'm more in, am interested in the ecological connections, uh, but most people say pre-European time. What was your pre-European time? And they look at, um, I don't know, the, I don't actually know fossil records. I don't know what they're looking at to determine it. Um, but if that, if you want to put like a, a mark in the sand, it's pre-European contact. So would that be like, I don't know, 1400s or something, but we know that ranges shift species ranges shift. And we, we know that um, that's happening all the time, but it's happening at an accelerated rate right now. So I would think if it's still a, a plant that is supporting uh, our native insects, that is important and not to get too hung up on the date, uh, but I, I bet there would be a million ecologists that would, would uh, disagree with me. Yeah, I've come across that too, for sure. And then um, someone just makes the point in the Q&A about true native wild plants versus cultivars. And that's mm -hmm. definitely something to be aware of when you, yeah. Yeah, and some people are okay with cultivars. I stay away from like nativars, we call them when they're a native species that's been cultivated, but I prefer to stick with the true species, um, especially with the herbaceous stuff because sometimes the cultivars have a very different flower form and that makes the pollen inaccessible to certain insects. But if you wanna learn more about that, there's the, I think it's called the uh, Mount, Mount Cuba Center in the uh, United States. And they do studies on, on nativars to see how they're being used by insects and if it's different 
when it's a native R versus the true species. So Mount Cuba has some research that they readily share on That's that great. topic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because some cultivars are far more away from the true plant than others. And yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I know when I've been, I've been really stuck. It was one time I, I, I could, I like the true plant myself as well, but you know, one time I was stuck and I was looking at the nursery at the cultivars just to see the options. And I it was open a nice day. And I noticed pollinators on a variety of cultivated cultivars, but not on one. And it's like, aha, that one's been <laughs> because they're not going to it. <laughs> um, do shrubs typically grow smaller in size in Ottawa versus Southern Ontario? Hmm. I'm sorry. I, I don't, I don't know. Definitely temperature, moisture, um, competition, all those things will impact the size of a shrub. And I, Sarah and I were talking about the ranges being so different. Uh, even just like when I encounter a beaked hazelnut by water, it's a different size and shape than it is somewhere else. But shade does seem to be a bit of a limiting factor for like flower and fruit production. So if those two things are of real interest to you, you want to make sure that you're giving it its preferred amount of sunshine. Mm. Um, a quick one here is elderberry native species to Ontario. We will have the native plant encyclopedia working. You can check the range, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. And, and there is one that yeah, definitely native to Ontario. Yeah. yeah, both of those ones you could put in if you're in Ontario. Mm. Elderberry is just fantastic. I just don't have the space because I'm in downtown <laughs> Toronto, but I love it. Yeah. So both of them. Now, do the native plants you featured also attract bees that are just, they're just as important as birds and other insects? The, the, the especially remember when we were talking about willow, we were saying that willow is a great early season uh, pollen source. And so our bees that come out early, they really need uh, sources of pollen early on. And willow is, is an exceptional option for them, high quality pollen. And Heather Holmes, I have her book up here. That's why I'm looking at it. I'll put this in the list. But if you're really interested in bees and just the whole idea that there are different qualities of pollen, you want to check out Heather Holm, H-O-L-M, uh, not no S at the end. This is one of her books. She has another one that's all about bees. So she's a bee ecologist as well as a horticulturalist. She will blow your mind, her knowledge. And her website and her Facebook page, she shares an awful lot. She's just interested in getting as much of this great information out as possible. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. She's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I had an aronia, but there seemed no interest in the berries. I took it out because it didn't look good uh, with mm -hmm. the drying up blackberries. Is it a question of having enough of them around? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, I actually don't get a lot of birds at my aronia either but I only have one on its own and it's right sort of tucked between my house and the porch in this little triangular shape. And I, I do wonder about that. Maybe what you, maybe you're making a good point there that it's not that obvious for them. Um, what's cool about high bush cranberry or some of these other fall uh, producing, fall fruit producing shrubs is that they have what's called a foliar uh, fruit display. So the fruit becomes really bright and ready to consume right when the foliage becomes really bright. And so it's very obvious to wildlife that that's where they're going to go and get fruit. Um, maybe, maybe you didn't get a lot of wildlife because, as you say, it wasn't very, it wasn't noticed by wildlife that much. But the aronia berries will carry on through the winter. That's very typical. And that's good because then it's another option if birds do find the shrub, an option for them, a food option. Great. And then does the Rosa Blanda attract Japanese beetles? That's a good question in general for native roses, I suppose. Oh I have Rosa Blanda and I don't get it. I do get, I do, don't get those beetles on my Rosa Blanda, but I do get them all over my Virginia creeper, which I love for the berries that are so nutritious for birds and the color, but I get them all over my Virginia creeper, which is a pain in the butt, not my Rosa Blanda, but I don't know if I'm just lucky or if that's standard. Um, I have a U, but having difficulty determining if it is a Canada U or another type, if it's non-native, I'd so like hard. to replace. I use the iNaturalist app, but then there are a couple key identifying um, features. I'm, I'm blanking on them now. If you go onto the naturalist websites or if you have a naturalist friend that's a botanist friend, um, I can't help you on that right now, but I would start with the iNaturalist app and other people use a... Um, plant, another plant app, plant identification app. I'm, what's the name now? 
Um, but they will help you. Like the, those are you, I have very good luck with iNaturalist getting down to the species level. Uh, so try that one. If you don't have luck, there's likely a local botanist organization. You could take a picture if you're on Facebook. I'm not on any of the other um, social media channels, but the Facebook naturalist pages. Uh, if I put something out there, or if you're in Ontario, field, field botany or field botanists of Ontario, their Facebook page, you can put a picture up there and they'll help you get down to the species and determine Thanks. if it's European or Canadian species. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, uh, we, and because you're not having any video and audio on your end, um, it's, instead of raising your hand, it's best to put a comment in the chat or a QA, and a a question in the Q&A, because um, that's what we can actually see and address. Uh, what is a mulch mat and donut? I guess I needed some clarification on that. Like it's a mulch mat is just uh, they take recycled newspaper and make like a flattened but thick uh, mat mat of so it's just like you could use old newspaper or old cardboard too, just to keep down the vegetation for the first growing season. And then uh, you can cover it. You don't need a mulch mat. I I often just use um, newspaper or cardboard if I want to put down to cut to say get rid of grass or um, some other vegetation I don't want before I'm planting. So that's what I meant by that. It's just a biodegradable mat, like a thick paper. And then the mulch uh, wood chips you can get, or you can just gather up leaves and use those around your plant. The idea is uh, a couple things, just to keep the soil moist and keep down the competition from grass or other, other uh, vegetation around the one item you've just put in. Great. And then suggestions for shady areas, please. I think a lot of what Colleen did mention can grow in partial shade, at least from my experience. And again, the Native Plant Encyclopedia, when we send the link, you can search by the lighting and other, other growing conditions. That will help you. I don't know if you have any favorites off the top of your head, Colleen, you want to mention, but mm. otherwise there are resources that they can follow up on. What I have found is that, well, ultra leaf dogwood is big, but it does well in shade, but you'd have to have a shade of really big trees. Um, it does better with partial shade. It does look dried out and less healthy in the sun. I don't know if you have the space for an ultra leaf dogwood. When I tried a few native species I have so little room. So sometimes I put them in the imperfect places. And then what's happened with my shrubs is they get way too leggy as they stretch and try and get to the sun. So that's mm -hmm. what's ha that happened with my aronia. And so I moved it. I, I, had, I also put sumac in, which I, was a disaster because it spread everywhere. I had to move it to my in-law's house. Um, so I don't, it, it, a lot of them have ranges and they will have more flowers and possibly a, a more tidy form if you put them in sun. If you put them in shade, they will often try, be a little more leggy because they're trying to get at the sun around whatever shade is above them. Uh, okay. Hard to say, but you've mentioned that, Sarah, you keep mentioning the, the encyclopedia and I do find it quite helpful for uh, prefer pre preferences for growing conditions. Oh, great, good. Um, let's see, do you have a recommendation of where to get some of these plants? I don't see them in native plant nurseries in my area, in the Toronto area. I know, again, we do have a native plant supplier list. We yeah. try to keep updated. You, you are familiar with the annual sales there to Colleen. Well, and if you're in Toronto and even a few of the regions around Toronto, you could try LEAF. So Local Enhancement and Appreciation of Forests, they offer woody species spring and fall, and they are taking orders, I think, right now for their shrubs and their trees. And that's a not-for-profit organization, not a business, but they get their trees and shrubs from specialized native nurseries, and they deliver them to your door. They can also plant them if you want to pay for that service. So that's a great option in, in the Toronto, the greater Toronto area, LEAF. Great, thanks. And then you also have, a, sometimes, I mean, depending on when life gets back to normal, some annual plant sales too by uh, North, American, North American Native Plant Society, yes. et cetera. Yeah. Okay, so uh, will presentation be available? Yes, we'll get the replay link to you afterwards. Um, my messiness invited mice. I haven't seen owl and other predators than the neighbor's cat. What is the best way to control this situation? Oh. Hmm. I don't know. If they're not coming in your house. I don't know if it's it's problematic. Um, and I don't know if you're in a newer subdivision or an older subdivision. 
that was during migration and that saw what showed up in the fall. It didn't, it didn't stay that long. I think it, it stayed for a day or two, which was amazing because everyone got to take photos of it. Um, so that was, I think, the exception. Um, I, I, I get mice. I also get, unfortunately, I'm dealing with rats in my compost right now, even though I, I fancy myself to be quite the good composter. So sometimes they just come and um, if they're not, if they're not getting in your home, maybe you, you tolerate them if you can. I, I just think that mess, the idea of messiness is just so absolutely important for habitat that then when the wildlife comes, we can't be too selective about which wildlife. <laughs> and but generally, it depends on your tolerance. And generally speaking, having the plants, I think with their own seed heads, et cetera, the berries, it attracts them less than having a bird feeder that drops the seed everywhere that isn't picked up regularly too. I, so. I agree. And that bird feeder mess can also be detrimental to birds. Uh, totally unintentionally, you can, uh, um, if you're not cleaning and tending, you can, you can spread disease uh, and then also attract raccoons. And, and in Toronto, bird feeders just feed the pigeons. So <laughs> not great. Um, so I know we're getting on, uh, it's gone quarter past here. So can you tell us more about fatty berries? Um, we're going to get the Grow Me Instead booklet so that we can include mm. in the email. Um, yeah, the Grow Me Instead booklet is from the Ontario Invasive Plant Council website. You can download it for free. If you want a hard copy, you can email them or email me, depending on where you are, I might be able to bring it by. I'm in West Toronto. Um, and then the high fat berries, uh, like high bush cranberry and Virginia creeper are two examples. And you can find more about that in Talamay's books, uh, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. They both talk about the, the science behind the, the fall berries, the nutrition, because I mean, Sarah, you, you brought this up and I, I didn't really, I forgot to mention it, but the idea that Yes, we do see, especially in satellite landscapes, we see birds consuming the non-native and invasive berries all the time. So what's wrong with that? Or do birds care whether it's, it's a non-native uh, shrub that they're going to for their fruit, uh, for their nourishment? And so researchers, scientists have looked at the nutrition level of say a, um, a European buckthorn or glossy buckthorn berry versus a high bush cranberry, American high bush cranberry berry. And, one will have more sugar, which is less helpful, and one will have more fat, which is more helpful. So it's the native with the high fat that is more helpful. And, and I'm just scratching the surface here, but it's really interesting the research that's been done. And Talamay talks about some of that research in his book, uh, Nature's Best Hope. Yeah, some great information in there for sure. Mm -hmm. um, how can you transition to more drought tolerant native shrubs on Vancouver Island? We're facing a lot of drought starting oh my gosh, late yeah. spring through fall. Well, hmm, and I'm sorry, I'm not super familiar with your native species. Uh, I love that part of the world. I wish I'd been born there, but <laughs> I'm here in Ontario. I would think that the in, uh, in British Columbia, you can take advantage of the Grow Me Instead Guide for British Columbia. And the Invasive Species Council in British Columbia is the most active by far, the largest by far. They have the Grow Me Instead. They also have a plant right program where they talk about putting the right plant in, in the right place. So I think those would be two good resources for you. And then your native plant society in British Columbia would also be a great source of information. And also, I, also adding compost to the soil and having lots of great organic matter and hummus to help the, the soil retain the moisture that it does get as well. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure what the soil is like there too. Um, Another BC one, uh, we have a problem with the viburnum leaf beetle. Some species are more attractive to the bug than others. Habitus cranberry, et cetera, um, are attractive to the beetle. And yeah, any thoughts on that? I, I'm sorry. I, Of course, I hear about that beetle all the time, but I have actually not experienced it. And I garden at my place in Toronto, and then I'm also trying to bring back native species to my in-laws cottage where they put in periwinkle and, and other invasive and non-native species. So we have viburnums there, the natives, and I don't see the beetle up there, but I hear about it here in Toronto. I'm sorry, I don't have, I don't have suggestions for you right now. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and <laughs> the question, we can't have them all the answers for sure. It's hard to know so much. We keep learning and discovering as we go too, I find. Yeah, 
and speaking of learning and discovering someone saying how to find out if the existing plants in my garden are native or non mm -hmm. and what i can do is again we've got some links already we're going to include in the follow-up email but also they can find some that perhaps you can use to check for ids and and just explore and i know just what you mentioned take pictures upload and see if anyone can help you recognize it and identify it yeah, the iNaturalist app, if you're up for trying that, is fantastic because you put it in and then someone is going to come and verify your observation and say yay or nay to what you think it is. And, and you don't have to, you don't even have to have any idea of what it is. You can put the picture in and say you don't know, or you can get it down to the genus with their help. Uh, and then if you want to suggest a species, suggest it. And then and then another person or two people have to confirm the species before it becomes research grade. So there's this really neat process. You end up sharing and learning together with other naturalists in your area. Yeah, great. And then appreciate would appreciate it, how to find resources for professionals to hire if we want the benefits of these mm -hmm. plants, not the time or effort to do it myself. And I have to admit, for years I've been wanting to put together a list of like. Uh, not just native plant suppliers, but those landscape professionals who have this mm -hmm. ethic around native plants or ecosystems and that understanding. Mm -hmm. That is a great idea. I, I mean, at the top of my head, I could list some in my area, but my goodness, it would be, I think, very helpful to have something like that on the CWF website, something you and I could work on maybe, Sarah. Yeah, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I mean, when you Google for people in your area, you can just Google different terms, whether it's, yeah. you know, it's environmentally minded, ecologically minded, zero escaping. I know some people have different terms they use to describe right. themselves and you might find some local person who's just not overly well advertised, but they still may be able to help you too. Mm -hmm. um, I recently learned, and I think we'll just take one more, two more questions and we'll call it quits and hopefully we'll have answered most of them by then. I recently learned to appreciate the value of alder, which I used to hate with a passion. Mm -hmm. Do you agree it is valuable for insects mm -hmm. and birds? Uh, yeah, I love alder. I mean, we have gray alder and, um, oh my gosh, what's the other one that's up at the cottage? We have a couple that are speckled alder. I love them. I think they're beautiful. They're often in sort of wet areas here in Ontario, our native ones. And yeah, and around the beaver pond, we have them. So some of them get taken away by the beaver which is fine. They do um, have more of a like a bushy look to them. So I'm not sure if everyone wants them, but they I think they would be fantastic for privacy. Uh, if you want a larger hedge, putting them side by side, you could do that. Um, the ones that I know of are they love wet feet. So putting them in a rain garden, that would also be helpful or along a, a pond. If you have a pond that you put in in your backyard. Yes, I love alder. I think they're fantastic. Thank the little you. speckled alder has that little cone like yeah yeah thing. It's just really yeah. cute <laughs> <laughs> yeah i like them too i know they can spread and whatnot but yeah. not always like we have some in the garden and they have not spread they've actually oh, stayed okay. so thank uh, okay two last questions because we are at the end so one is do these berry shrubs attract bears in rural areas and the second one is a bit more complicated. Do you think that there are ethical issues with the horticultural industry moving genotypes of native plants around with potential genetic impacts on natural populations? Hmm. Well, I guess we'll start with the bear one. <laughs> um, so I, I don't garden anywhere where I have to worry about bears. So for you, you people that do, um, I guess that is a consideration, but uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. I guess you have to consider what wildlife are in your neighborhood whenever you do various things, including gardening. And yes, we know that in the fall, bears do consume quite a bit of, of quite a few berries. They have to consume a lot of berries. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. I guess you do have to consider that. If you have bear in your neighborhood, maybe you do want to uh, alter your list of plants for your garden so that you're not attracting them. It's your house. And then the other one, uh, genetic uh, moving moving plants around. Are there ethical issues with the hort industry moving genotypes of native plants around with potential mm -hmm. genetic, genetic impacts on the natural populations? Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, I, I love to go, if I'm buying plants and I've basically run out of space, I've planted in my neighbor's yards, but I like to go to the, in my neighborhood, the specialized native plant nurseries 
Most of them have been started by botanists who were just tired of seeing all the non-native and invasive stuff coming in. So they took their love of and their knowledge of botany and they started these businesses because those people are collecting seed locally, say within a hundred kilometer radius or whatever it might be. And so they're picking native species and they're collecting it locally and growing it locally and selling it to quite a smaller area, not, you know, not sending them off to um, by mail order to various places. I would be very, I, I wouldn't be a fan of, uh, you know, purchasing plants off of these, these huge uh, companies that sell and do mail order plants that that doesn't appeal to me, but I ethically, I have a, I have a few problems with the horticultural industry, but I don't want to, I want to work with them. I want to see them as a, as like a solution, part of the solution. And I think that in small ways, there's progress that's being made and the horticultural outreach collaborative that I work on that produced the Grow Me Instead guide is an example of the kind of collaboration we need more of. And I'll add also, you know, the, consu the consumer power, your voice yeah. has power. And I find that the more we approach our local nurseries and let them know what we want, we want, you know, plants grown without neonicotinoids. We want regionally native plants and the true kind versus the cultivar preps. So if you let your local nurseries know what you want, the more they hear that, the more they're going to say, oh, okay, that we're here, we're noticing a trend because it actually is a trend. So we can be a part of that trend and add our, our weight to it as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Listen, I, we've come to the end of the questions. Just one shout out to, to Kristen. Yes, I will have a link in the email for you uh, where you can find some native shrubs for, for the East Coast. And I know a book actually that you might really enjoy with an author out there um, that I'll include in the link too. So I'll make a note of that. But Colleen, thank you so much for your time. You stayed on extra to help us with all these questions. And I know people oh, have been pleasure. very appreciative. We still have lots joined mm -hmm. with us. So I hope you all got lots out of it. We seems to be a great hit with many people. So thank you so very, very much for sharing your oh, time. Thank you for inviting me. And I did put my Gmail down there. So if you want to send me a question, uh, feel free. I don't know if I'll be able to answer it, but I'd, I'd be happy to help, help, help you figure it out. Thank you so much. So have a good night, everybody. And Thank uh, wherever you. you are in Canada, thanks for joining us. And goodbye, Colleen. <laughs> Take care.